Well, we're talking about crafting a lyric and a melody for the local church, and we're moving on to the characteristics of a congregational melody. So that begs the question, what are the characteristics of a congregational melody? Why do some melodies stick in our head and some others just kind of pass us by? What, what is it about a melody that sticks to the wall? And uh, there's, a bit of, um, there's a bit of mystery to it all, but I do believe that some uh, melodies that have stood the test of time do share some common characteristics. And it's those common characteristics that we want to talk about today. Because I think once you're able to identify what these are, you can start being intentional about um, using and, and writing uh, melodies that, are, that have these characteristics in them. Okay, so here's the first thing. Very simple. Congregational melodies are singable. Okay, I always tell my songwriting students, remember that people sing melodies, not chord progressions. You know, I'll have, um, I'll have a, a student come to me and say, hey, uh, hey, Mr. said I got this great progression. You know, it goes like this. My answer is well, it's been done a million times. You know the whole the the one four six minor five thing. Um, it's been done a million times, and the reality of it is, is when people go walking down the street and they remember a song, they're not singing chord progressions, but they're singing melodies. Okay, so I I always encourage people um, to view your melody as a beautiful painting. Okay, and view the chords as the frame that goes around that painting. Uh, you'll remember, um, you know, pretty much everyone knows or has an idea of what the Mona Lisa looks like. And if you were to go over to, to Paris, the Louvre, to go see the Mona Lisa, when you walked in and you went to, the, to see the Mona Lisa, you wouldn't, you know, fall on your knees and say, oh my goodness, what an amazing frame that is. That's an incredible frame around the Mona Lisa. Uh, you know, that'd be absurd. Of course, you're looking at the painting by Leonardo da Vinci and you're saying, wow, look at that painting. Isn't it amazing? Well, I liken our melodies to our painting and our chord structures to the frame. The frame does have an important part to play, and the frame can really determine how the perspective of a, of a song sounds and, and how the perspective of a painting is viewed. But really, the thing that, that people remember is the painting. Okay, So if you could liken your melodies to a painting, uh, that's a good place to start. It's the melody that people will remember. Effective songs for the masses have infectious hooks that stick to the wall. Now, like I was just saying, the, the frame, our chords, uh, have an important role to, to play. I often use this example. Some of you guys will be familiar with the song by Reuben Morgan, Lord, I Give You My Heart. And um, <clears throat> the verse of it starts off this way. This is my desire. take that same chord progression, that same frame around the painting, and keep the painting the same, but have it look different and feel different. For instance, uh, I'm going to keep the melody exactly the same, but I'm just going to frame it now with different chords. <clears throat> this is my desire. done there is I've kept the melody the same, but I've just framed it with different chords. So it kind of has a different feel, it has a different sonority to it. But at the end of the day, the melody remained the same. And the melody is what people are going to take away singing. Long after the church service is done, throughout the week, the truth that's being written on their heart is being written in that consistent melody, not the chord progression. Now the chord progression, again, changed the feel, it framed the melody differently, made it sound differently, kind of uh, re-energized it, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe uh, gave it a different feel than what is normally um, uh, expected in it, but it's the melody that is the real gold of the, of the composition. So the key in writing great congregational songs is writing great melodies. Um, and like I said, effective songs that ha for the masses have infectious hooks that stick to the wall. The best way to see if your melody is memorable is to demo it and to really just test it with your friends and then pilot it in the congregation. And if people are actually singing it, you know, the, the test of any worship leading is to see if people are singing. And if people are actually singing with you, you know that they're with you and you know that the melody is singable. Um, Another thing to remember as you're crafting a, a melody is that congregational melodies have more limitations than what I'd call artist songs because they are intended to be accessible and sung by the masses, not just the trained voice. So it's important that you really think key when you're, when you're, writing, um, when you're writing congregational melodies. My rule of thumb that I've adopted from uh, artists like Keith and Kristen Getty and Stuart Townend um, is that I try not to go above um, D or E4. And if I'm, you know, if I'm doing that on the keyboard, and if I, 
if my melody is consistently hitting a, a, a D or an E, um, I'm going to probably transpose it down. And at the same time, I want to make sure that there's some depth uh, in, in, to where the melody is going. And I might have to augment my melody if it, if it spans a big range to make sure that uh, you know the lowest note is singable, but the highest note is singable as well. But I think it's very important as we write songs, the goal of our songs is to be sung. And the reality of it is, is if we go beyond that D or that E4, we're going to lose our altos, and we're going to lose our, our men unless they're true tenors. And one of the sacrifices great worship leaders make is that they sing in songs that aren't necessarily great for them, but are great for the masses. Because if anybody ought to be making a sacrifice, it ought to be the person on the stage leading worship, making it easy for other people to enter in. So that's really important as we not only choose songs for worship, but as we compose them as well, is to make sure that they're in keys that people can sing. The reality of it is, is if it's not, what will happen is, uh, you know, if you got some trained musicians, they'll drop to a harmony, which is great, but most people aren't really trained to even be able to hear harmonies, so what they'll end up doing is just kind of crossing their arms. And then effectively, you know, the song that you wanted everyone to enjoy and to latch on and to use as an expression to God has now hit a brick wall, and it's not functioning the way it ought to be because people simply can't sing it. So really make sure that your congregational melodies um, uh, are within the parameters of, of, of a singable melody. And again, my rule of thumb in terms of how high it goes is usually a D or an E. And if I have a song even that's hitting up there consistently, I'll, I'll transpose it down a half step. I'll just make the sacrifice. And, you know, guitarists will say, oh, I don't want to play in flattened keys and this, that, and the other thing. And I get that. Some, some uh, voicings are easier uh, to have open voicings than it is to have to use a capo or to use all bar chords. But at the end of the day, uh, it's not necessarily about how it sounds. It's about people being able to use a song to meet with God. So if you're looking at things through those lenses, I think you'll be on the right track. Um, so we've talked a little bit about not writing your melody above D4. Um, and talking about how it's been out of the, out of the range. Um, now, with that said, I do think that there's a time for churches to actually sing out and to be pushed really to the very top of that range. Um, you know, I think of the song, uh, How Great Is Our God, and we typically, um, here at my church, play that, I think, in the key of B. So you have that, you have that, great, that great chorus. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God. And then you get into that bridge, which really kind of acts as a second chorus, and it's, it's, you know, you know, it's up there. It's hitting the E flat and the E natural, um, but, or pardon me, for the key of B, that's D sharp and E natural, but, um, but it's really pushing at the top of the range, and I think that there's a time to have that, um, just maybe not consistently through the whole song, but it's great when people can name above all names, and just sing up there at the top of the range. I think that there's a time for that. Pitching your songs in the right setting will often determine if congregational congregations will sing it, own it, and enjoy it. And that's what we're going after. We want to impart truth into people. We want them to enjoy it and to own the song. If you want your songs to succeed, uh, make sure that you have them pitched correctly. So this is just the first part in, uh, in crafting a great melody for a congregational song. We're going to continue this discussion uh, with three more things. But again, to review, uh, we just want to, we want to first start off with congregational songs are singable. People don't sing chord progressions, they sing melodies. Uh, and the second thing is that congregations have melodies that have limitations to them that are different than artist songs, different than the songs that would maybe be sung by Adam Levine of Maroon 5, uh, on the radio, or, or Lady Gaga, or other things that you hear on the radio, um, they, they have different limitations. And of those limitations, one of them is really key. Um, it, literally, it's key. And making sure that your songs are pitched in a way that, um, that the melody doesn't get too high in the key that you have it set in. Um, that said, we also, we also mentioned that there is a time to have a congregation sing out, and we shouldn't be afraid to have a, a portion of a song just really pushing the top of a range and allowing um, participants in the congregation to, to really sing truth at the top of their range. So those are the first couple of things, and uh, we'll be posting the conclusion to this. Uh, three more things that are characteristic of great congregational melodies uh, when we're thinking about writing songs for the local church.